Joining us in the studio are Dr. Selke Niederhaus, a transplant surgeon and two-time transplant recipient. And joining her is the donor for her second transplant, Felicia Stolusky. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. To simplify this story, doctor, you were walking around with one of Ms. Stolusky's kidneys. Nailed it. How did this come about? That was a long journey, if you ask me. Um, I had my first transplant back in 1988, and then ultimately that you, you failed. You were just a child. I was just point. a kid, yeah, I was yeah. 11. And um, that kidney, you know, I made it last for a long time. And uh, when it failed, tried to get back on the transplant list as soon as possible. So I knew for about five years before the transplant happened that my kidney was not doing well and I was able to be waiting on the list. And Felicia, you were, uh, your situation was it was your mother who needed a kidney? Yes. But you weren't able to donate directly to her? Correct but I was happy to participate in the Parrot Exchange program. How does a Parrot Exchange program work? Um, in general, so if you're not a match for your loved one, uh, they will match you with somebody that you are compatible with, and then your loved one in return will get a kidney or organ from another donor. So the two of you did not know each other. No. We, we have some video from, from when you, you first met what, what was that like? It what was, were the in a way, amazing. I mean, I'd always, with my first transplant, I knew it came from a nine month old baby, right? And we always felt sorry for the parents and were hoping we could have met them. And we never had the opportunity because at that time there was no such connection possible. And um, today, these connections are possible, even if you get a kidney from a deceased donor. And so for me, actually meeting someone who donated a kidney for me was just unbelievable. So I didn't quite know how to act. I didn't know what to expect. And you know, we decided to film it and do it live on TV for the benefit of posterity's sake and to embarrass me properly. <laughs> Felicia, and how, to raise how awareness, you too. Yeah, that. how did you think about it? Um, I mean, do you think, like, that's a little part of me that's over there now. I thought it was um, absolutely great to meet her before I um, had the surgery. My goal was if the recipient was open to it, I would have really wanted to have the chance to connect. So I was happy that we did that and our children were part of it and the children got to interact together as we all made pottery. So it was, it was so a really special experience. And it was your mom who needed a kidney, and she got it basically from somebody else. How's she doing? Yes, um, she's doing great. Um, she's responded really well. She's going to turn 80 in July, Terrific. Um, and she keeps in touch with with her donor. So it's just really special to have those connections. Does that tend to happen in these these paired cases? More and more. Um, the trouble with transplantation is the long waiting list, right? And one way to overcome this long waiting time that for some people can exceed 10 years of where they need to be potentially on dialysis is that we're trying to increase how many living donor transplants we do. And it actually turns out that in many families and circles of friends, people are just not compatible but healthy enough to donate. And so since about the mid, uh, 2005, 2006, people have started sort of thinking about how can we trade organs if we have two pairs that are incompatible swapping. And then, you know, sometimes they met in the hospital, right, because they were all in the same vicinity. Um, and now we're doing it in longer and longer chains. And it's really helped tremendously. Um, without being too technical, what goes into a match? Like, are, are siblings more likely to match first degree relatives or? It depends on how you define a match. Back in the day, we defined matches based on six tissue types, right, that we measured where you get three from your mom and three from your dad. And so siblings, because of that, were somewhat more closely related, right? Identical twins are a perfect match, pretty much always, special case. Um, but nowadays, we don't measure it that way anymore. So in order to look for a match, we really just look for incompatibility. So we measure basically the antibody that I would have in my blood that would react to other people in general. And then we know about how many people could be a match. And if the other person doesn't have those antigens, we consider them a match. So it's a little backwards these days and much more complicated. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about uh, kidney donation, kidney transplants, give us a call at the number on the screen or send an email to livequestions at mpt.org. Felicia, you, you said you wanted to raise uh, awareness of this. Why, yes. why is that so important to you? How, how I was, was your mom waiting? 
she was on dialysis for about a year and a half. And uh, the, the process was very smooth. I felt very confident and truly trusted what the doctors informed me about in terms of how safe the surgery is. The long-term outcomes are very comparable with anybody that has two healthy kidneys. And um, because the, the surgery is so successful, why not save more people's lives? And I think that there is a notion, and in fact, when I was preparing for the surgery, there were people that were concerned about my health and, and that I was still young and I had young children. But I think correcting that misconception that it affects your life expectancy or your quality of life is a really important thing to do. I guess the, the only thing you would worry about is, you know, we mostly come with, with two of these, and if you take one out, are you at risk of, you know, something happening to the other one? Does it wear out? I mean, or no? Well, you're always at risk, right? I mean, you could cross the road and get hit by a car tonight. Sure. So when you look at risk in different ways, there have been different studies done. And so when we compare kidney donors with the general population, they tend to live longer, healthier lives. That's probably because they're cherry-picked to be the healthiest to start with. But even then, they did other studies comparing, you know, almost identical people, right, matching them. Um, those who donated and those who didn't. And the outcomes were very minimally different to the point that, you know, it's a little bit of a stroke of luck. And then the organ donation system also has a backup plan for people who donate their kidneys while they're living donors, and that we try to get them up to the top of the list or near the top of the list if they were to ever go on and need a kidney. And the chance of that is maybe one out of 10,000 or less. As the recipient, you've got to do some degree of uh, immune suppression. Mm -hmm. So the body doesn't re reject the organ, but it's far preferable, I guess, to dialysis. Far preferable. Has it, it changed? Unspeakably so. Hmm. The immunosuppression has changed some. It's very difficult to do trials, right, because the immunosuppression outcomes at one year after transplant are pretty good with what we have. So if we're trying to do better, we have to really look at what will happen to the drug after 15 years, and that's an expensive trial. So they're hard to fund and then hard to prove benefits. So it's hard to make progress on immunosuppression at this point in time. I read the story of your, your first surgery when you were receiving the transplant, and the, the doctor, you were 11, I guess, and the doctor asked what you wanted to be when you grew up. Yeah, I said a transplant surgeon, yeah. here I am, look at this. It's, it's crazy, right? That's, that's an awesome story. How many, how many yeah. kidneys or other organs have you cumulatively transplanted? I have no idea. I transplanted 45 kidneys in the first two months of my fellowship in 2012. Um, kept going, right, busily, and then sort of, I don't know, I have no idea. So what's new in, in kidney transplantation? I mean, the, the living donor thing, University of Maryland pioneered that. And, uh, and that and the, the whole process and the, the technical aspects of the surgery, it's kind of old hat at this point. Yeah, the say? technical aspects are, you know, same old, same old, right? Uh, we try to be always more aggressive using sicker organs and organs from sicker donors as just the general health of the population declines and as our survival gets better, our donor population now is very different from what donors used to be in the 1980s. That said, there's still a huge shortage of donor organs, and so the newest thing people are working on is this thing called xenotransplantation, where we try to take organs from another species and try to transplant them into humans. And you may have seen that on you know, other news articles and you know, shows that this is starting to happen, but at this point in time, it's very much still research and usually always sort of a one-off. What, what is your experience? What, what, are, what do your in instincts tell you about whether that's gonna be a a thing down the road a decade or two? I think something needs to be, right? Because when you look at other things having made progress, computers now are smartphones, right? The dialysis machine is still like a massive <laughs> box when you go, she's laughing, right? Because yeah. it's true. Um, and we can do better. Now, whether that will ultimately be a bionic kidney or a xenotransplant or that we're growing our own human organs from our own stem cells in the lab, something needs to go. At the moment, xenotransplant is starting to happen in sort of these last 
ditch effort scenarios, and I hope it goes somewhere, but I think there are huge barriers to really making true clinical trials come to life with these types of organs in terms of safety and efficacy. For a pig transplant, you need even more immunosuppression right now, and that's obviously dangerous, and then you worry about infections and viruses that could come from the animals into the humans, right? We've just lived through a pandemic. We don't want to cause one. So there are definitely risks and things that really need to be carefully considered. What are the, what are the conditions that most commonly lead somebody to needing a, a, a kidney? Mostly it's diabetes and high blood pressure. So if you have someone with diabetes or high blood pressure in your family, or if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, you should get your kidneys checked at least once a year. Very, very important you know, are, in um, order for you to do well. And there are certain medications that if you take in high doses, it's, um, what is it, a leave? Yeah, any, that any, you any don't, profen. Um, you don't realize that long-term use of them, it's your kidney that's processing those medications. My mother did not have a cause. She did not have diabetes, and her, her high blood pressure was managed, so. So how was it noticed, just routine lab work? Routine blood work. Yes. She's lucky though. Most people with yeah. kidney disease don't know they and have she, kidney um, disease. They don't even know it. She, I don't remember what stage she was diagnosed, but I, from the time that she and I talked about it, she did go from stage three to stage four to stage five. But there was no known cause, so perhaps it was from overuse of some of those um, medications. Did, was there a moment where you had second thoughts about it? No. You were helping your mom. Yes, 100%. And you were helping your mom sort of on a, put it in, in uh, billiards terms, it was like a bank shot. I was 100% for everything she did for me. This was the least I could do for her. That was kind of the mantra the whole time. Of course, my father being the overprotective father was concerned, but. You have one of those too? But I was, because I, I felt so trusting. You know, I did my research, whether it was with the doctors, but also on my own. I did my research. I had an envelope with all of the materials. I completely trusted the process 100% never hesitated. Well, one way people can do the research is you have a website, umd.edu slash donate life. It's donate dash life. Um, tell me about um, what's happening with other types of organs. You do pancreas transplants. Yeah, I trained in abdominal organs. We sort of split the organs at the diaphragm, right? So there are cardiothoracic surgeons that go on to do a transplant fellowship for heart and lung. And then the abdominal crowd, they do liver, kidney, pancreas for the most part. The pancreas is sort of the orphan organ. Liver transplants are pretty common. We do about 100 a year. Kidneys even more common, about 170 a year, University of Maryland numbers. And then pancreas transplants, we try to do about 20 a year. And the benefit for that is, is that it cures diabetes, and it's fantastic when you combine it with a kidney, um, because then you can cure diabetes and kidney failure and really get a patient who is free from all sorts of treatments and day-to-day -day worries that they would otherwise have. And Felicia, what, what was the most common question you got when you, you told your friends what, what you were doing? I didn't really get questions, but I got surprise. It was, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're really gonna do this. And, 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 and I guess that there was some questioning about the health impacts on me, which- Worked out great. Worked out great. Well, so glad you could both be here. Thanks really so us. glad you could both be here. Silky Niederhaus and Felicia Skoluski, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.